Hi there, I'm Hugh Martin, and you're watching a podcast where nostalgia comes alive. It's Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. Roll it. Welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Since July of 2021, Jake and his friends have interviewed professionals in the worlds of acting, directing, writing, puppeteering, and many more. Who will they be chatting with in this week's interview? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. Happy to be here with us. Thank you for joining. As always, I'm your host, Jake Duffenbaugh. With me today, as always, our goes Chris Bixby and Matt Bingle. How are you guys doing? Doing good. Doing great. Hello, everybody. How are you, Jake? I do agree, Matt. Thank you for asking. Chris, which we have for today. Today's guest is a puppeteer, writer, and director. Since the early 80s, he has worked on Sesame Street as a puppeteer and now as a director for the show. But some of his other most well-known roles in the puppet world include playing Magellan on Eureka's Castle, Leon on The Puzzle Place, Keiko on Ubi, and of course, Bear on Bear in the Big Blue House. Please welcome Noel McNeil. Noel, happy to have you here. Hi, guys. Thanks so much for having me. And Hi out there and Poddom. Thanks for listening. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Glad to have you here. Yes. Cool. Absolutely glad to have you here. So to kick this off, so could you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and what you do? Uh, let's see. I am many things <clears throat> to many people. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a husband and a dad. Uh, I've been a son. I am professionally a puppeteer, a writer, a director. I've also been an author, a producer, and uh, I've done many, many things for many, many people for many, many years. And if you grew up in the 90s and watched way too much TV, you probably saw something I did. (laughs) Awesome. So uh, what was your childhood like before working as a puppeteer? Um, Well, basically, uh, I grew up in um, central Harlem. I'm a native New Yorker. And um, uh, my mom uh, raised me. She was a single mom because uh, her husband, my dad, walked out on us when I was 18 months old. So she was taking care of me as well as her mom and uh, her uncle. And we all lived together in uh, in the same apartment. And in order to uh, uh, get me through junior high, high school, the uh, choices in the neighborhood were either the uh, high school where the kid got stabbed or the high school where the kid got shot. So she uh, looked into private school and, <clears throat> excuse me, enrolled me in the road school down on 54th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue, which was across the street from the Museum of Modern Art. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and then after that, uh, when it came time to pick out a college, um, I was wondering what to, to be. And this was during the height of The Muppet Show because growing up, there were a lot more uh, puppet shows on TV. There was Captain Kangaroo, Mr. Rogers, Sherry Lewis. Uh, Paul Winchell had a show, a syndicated show called Winchell Mahoney Time. And he was a ventriloquist with uh, Jerry Mahoney and Knucklehead Smith. And Paul Winchell then later on became voice actor for many cartoons of Hanna-Barbera as well as the original voice of Tigger and he also co-invented the artificial heart. So right, puppeteers yeah. can save lives. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so um, so during the height of Muppet Show, and I followed, you know, Jim Henson in the Muppets career, starting with Sesame Street. And so I thought, well, if he's doing it, these people are doing it, maybe I could do it. So I did research the old fashioned way. I went to the library, which is like Barnes and Noble, but it's free. And I looked up two colleges in the area. One was uh, in Stores, Connecticut, the University of Connecticut, Yukon, in Stores, Connecticut, which to this day, you can get your master's degree in puppetry. And the other at that time was at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. And at that time, they had a theater department, which included a course in puppetry, which was taught by the designer and builder for Big Bird and Snuffy, uh, Kermit Love. And no, the frog was not named after him. It's just a freaky coincidence. Mm-hmm. And so I did all the research. And now I'm about to present this to, to again, the single mom who was working two jobs put me through private school. And so I said, okay, I know what I want to be, a puppeteer. And just 
braced myself for the reaction. And she looked at me and said, okay, what do we have to do? Oh, okay, well, there's this school and then there's this school. Okay, what do we have to do? Oh, well, this school needs this by this and this school needs that by that. And said, okay, what do we have to do? That's all she kept saying. She never belittled it. She never dismissed it. She never said had a backup plan. But she said, because at that point she had become a uh, private secretary having risen the ranks in the steno pool. And she said, I've been typing the same letters for the past 25 years. You can always get a job. So don't get a job, get a career. And so we filled out everything. And I said, you're really okay with this? And she said, yes. And if for some reason tomorrow you want to become a lumberjack, we'll figure out how to do that. So I had major support from the get-go. <laughs> nice. That's wonderful. So now um, your career with puppetry began on the Great Space Coaster, taking on the world of Knock Knock. How did you kind of begin working on that show? Um, it's because of the fact that the puppets for the Great Space Great Space Coaster were designed and built by Kermit's uh, studio. He had his own studio separate from the Muppets. So they built those puppets. And then when um, John Lovelady, who was the original puppeteer for Knock Knock, uh, left, uh, I auditioned and I got the part uh, thanks to um, the fact that Kermit knew me and he needed a puppeteer. And so he recommended me. So I got to do that. John Lovelady, by the way, left the show to be the puppeteer on the primetime NBC series, Mr. Smith, which is about an orangutan that gets elected to the U.S. Congress. Oh, wow. That's which at the time, back then, this was like, you know, 1983, seemed absolutely ludicrous. By today's standards, it would be welcome. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yes, it would. Certainly an interesting concept, if you ask me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sure if you looked on YouTube, you could probably find clips of it. Oh, somewhere. I'm sure. So, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, yeah. with all those VHS recordings from the 80s, I'm sure we would. So yeah. so how did working on the Great Space Coaster transition into joining Sesame Street? Um, well, Pratt Institute, the uh, theater department, was being phased out when I would got my interview, um, they said that we're phasing out the department. So I was the last one that they were letting in. In fact, for my year, I was like the only one they were being like let in. And so I realized by the time I graduated, I really would be in a class by myself. So the summer, it was like a month just before going back to Pratt for my senior year, uh, Kermit's assistant on Sesame Street uh, quit. And so it was the job was open. So he asked me, would I be interested? And so a microsecond later, I said, sure. And so I just never went back to Pratt. And so I just went straight to uh, Sesame Street to become the Wrangler, which is the person who preps the puppets and makes sure they're all camera ready, uh, that Big Bird's feather is all nice and groomed down, that Oscar is like, you know, nice shaken and like grubby looking and any props or rigging that has to be done. Um, that's what I did. And so I got this brand new education in television production because I was going to the penultimate children's show and sitting in on production meetings and just going there, you know, being there five days a week working on this. And so that was quite the, uh, the education. And so no regrets in going from like straight into uh, TV. And that was in the fall of uh, 1982. So I've been associated with uh, Sesame Street for now like 42 years. Wow. That's wonderful. Yes. That's great. So some of your most notable roles on Sesame Street was performing a number of uh, Mr. Snuffleupagus's relatives. Got to yes. perform a lot of those. What were, what were those like? Um, well, Snuffy is um, what's called a body puppet, just like Big Bird is a body puppet. They're not costumes; they're a body. They're puppets because you can actually animate them the same way you would um, a smaller version, like you know Kermit or right. Grover. So um, is they're just bigger, and so Snuffy takes two people. It takes person in the front to do the mouth and the eyes, and 
the snuffle, and then somebody in the back to to be the back legs and the back. And so I I got to be you know the front in order to be Snuffy's mom, Snuffy's dad, Snuffy's uncle, Snuffy's mailman, Snuffy's grandmother, Snuffy's personal trainer, Arnold Snuffleupagator, which you can see on YouTube. Oh, that's um, funny. Yeah, and there's and it's um you have a monitor that's strapped to the side inside uh, of Snuffy. So this way, what you saw at home is what I saw. That's the only way you could really see out, other than opening the mouth but looking straight down at the floor. So you really can't see uh, ahead of you. So, uh, but it was but it was always fun and warm, but fun. <laughs> that's great. Mm. Uh- Awesome. So uh, I'm kind of curious, who were some of your favorite celebrity guests to work with on Sesame? Oh, yeah, we had a, a lot. Um, ex- one of the first ones that I always say was like the nicest was um, comedian John Candy, who is from SCTV and Uncle Buck. And, um, and from um, he, he's the, uh, the guy that uh, Catherine O'Hara meets trying to get back home to Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone. And he came on as this character from SCTV, um, Josh Schmengi of the Schmengi Brothers. So it's a sort of polka accordion playing character. And he was truly one of like the nicest guys. Once he was done, because um, we, we broke for lunch and his bit was done so he could leave. And so we were going to lunch and he's like, it's like, oh, where are you guys going? And we're like, well, there's this Italian place across the street. He was like, oh, like, do you mind if I come? We're like, no, of course not. Sure. So... Uh, he, uh, we got across the street and he ended up treating us for lunch, which was really nice. And at the end, uh, we were heading back into the studio. His car was there to take him, um, to back to his hotel. And, uh, he hugged, uh, Carol Spinney. He hugged Debbie Spinney, Carol's wife. And then he hugged me, which was so nice. And he didn't have to, but he like, was just generally a really sweet guy. And plus he actually got to work with the Muppets because he was at the end of the, the the Sesame Street movie Fall That Bird, and he plays the uh, the motorcycle cop who pulls over the two villains. But that's the only scene he's in, and there's no Muppets. So he always felt disappointed that he was in this movie, but never actually worked with any of the Sesame Street Muppets. So finally, he uh, he he got to do it, which was really nice. Um, he was he was really good. That's wonderful. I- Another uh, celebrity bit I uh, really liked that you uh, worked with was a number with uh, Patti LaBelle, the gospel alphabet. Yes. 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 The infamous story that I've told more than once. Yes. (laughs) 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 That you can all check out on YouTube. But yes. Yes. So it's like, yes, it's, it's right. She, she was, she was great. I actually had worked with her, Peter and I, Peter Lintz and I had worked with her before on um, the um, puzzle place, uh, direct to video special and uh, the holiday special. Oh, yes. And, uh, yeah. And it was a wraparound for the holiday episode we did, but they did wraparounds out in Long Island. And so at the very, very end, that's when she came and we all crammed into this sleigh and uh, against Chroma Key. And she was singing, I think, Jingle Bells. And uh, we were like bopping along with her. So then she came on Sesame Street to sing the, the alphabet. And again, you can watch this on YouTube. <laughs> and so um, she's up on a platform. And so she's next to little Chrissy, uh, named after Chris Surf, this marvelous music director. For oh, I love Chris. Chris Surf. Yes. Yes. Yes, who, uh, yes, who also voiced little Chrissy, which was great. Mm-hmm. And so as she's singing, the Sesame Street, Sesame Street characters gather in around her. And it's very tight because, you know, it's like, it's not widescreen. You got to be like tight and, you know, she, she's right in the middle. And so there are monitors on the floor, but you really can't like move too much. You just have your arm up in the air and I have Bert. And so after she sings the slow version comes the gospel breakout dance version where all the characters are bopping. And I'm like having Bert dance. And I look down at the monitor and I suddenly notice one of Bert's eyes is missing. <laughs> and that's because next to Bert is the Count. And the Count has that pointy collar. And the collar got right behind Bert's left eye and flicked it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So suddenly now, Bert has to dance in profile. <laughs> but then, of course, 
at the very end, everybody has to look at Patty for that final note. And so just as he sings it, Bert whips around really quick. So you don't see, <laughs> you go from profile to back of head <laughs> in half a second. And then just like laughing at all that and just like back into profile. So then they play it back because they always played it back. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking and I'm looking and then suddenly I, I noticed that the eyes gone and suddenly I'm doing profile. Nobody else does. And so uh, whenever it was good, they would say that's a buy. And they said, that's a buy. And I was like, no. And I just very slowly just held up Bert. And they saw <laughs> that he was suddenly this cyclops and the gasp. And everybody was just like, don't move. It just like looked down. They found the eye. And so what they did, what we that take was great. It was like perfect. So to save it, they, we did what's called pickups. And so we did these shots of clusters of characters dancing that got inserted into the the, the master shot. And so that's why you suddenly see cutaways of like characters dancing and then back to the wide shot with Petty in order to, to save it. But you can still see when Bert whips around <laughs> and then <laughs> in order to, you know, not show that he's just lost an eye, which by the way, was double stuck onto his eye, which always to this day, it's like, why is his eyes double stuck on? It's not like you're going to use this puppet for anything else. It's Bert. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Blew the eyes on. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> so um, earlier you briefly mentioned uh, Follow That Bird. Um, can you share any memories from uh, working on Follow That Bird? Yeah, we did it in Canada, just outside of uh, Toronto. And so um, it was great. It was the summer of uh, 1984. So it was uh, well, 40 years ago this coming summer because it came out the following year, 1985. And um, we stayed in uh, the Royal York Hotel, which was this grand old uh, train station. In fact, the largest hotel in North America, or at least for uh, at that time. And it was because of the, the railroad station across the street. And so it was great. And we um, got to be there like all summer. And so Toronto's beautiful. I love Toronto. It's a beautiful city. And... We had celebrity guests like Waylon Jennings, who became very close friends with uh, Carol and Debbie, Debbie Spinney. Um, I also got to be the Wrangler again, taking care of Big Bird. But I also got to be Big Bird's like double. So whenever uh, in stand in, so when setting up the shots, I would do it. And then, you know, if, Car if uh, Big Bird needed to be chased by a helicopter, sometimes that was me. And so uh, I also got to have my own character, which was a character named Madam Chairbird. So she starts the movie by uh, by being the leader of this do-gooder society called the Feathered Friends, who try to put um, birds in nice bird families. And so they realize there's this case about this bird that lives on a place called Sesame Street with all these humans, but he really should be with a bird family. And so that kind of sets it up with this uh, do-gooder named uh, Miss Finch, who's like, the social worker who places Big Bird in the, the family, the Dodos. And then when Big Bird doesn't like it and runs away, she's trying to find him to take him back to the Dodos. His friends from Sesame Street are trying to find him to take him back to Sesame Street. And meanwhile, there are these two villains, the Sleeves Brothers, who want to capture him and 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 have him be part of their uh, circus sideshow. And uh, even paint him blue to become the Bluebird of Happiness. So it's like... But yeah, but it was a, it's a great, it's a really great movie, by the way. Here's oh, yes, cat. it is. This is Lola. Oh, oh. Lola, this is the boys. <laughs> Hi, guys. There you go. Okay, go. In case you heard, in case you hear any yowling <laughs> later, that's because of her. So it's like, mm -hmm. off of you. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, follow that. That's no right. Yeah, follow that bird. Yeah. It's amazing. Really yeah, but it is. still holds up. It's because of Tony Geis and Judy Friedberg who wrote it. And it yes. still holds up. And yeah. it's all about, you know, a family is is people who love you. Like yeah. that's it, and that's exactly. it. And what's nice is at the end when Miss Finch comes to collect Big Bird because he's finally made it back to Sesame Street. Uh, she wants to take him back, and Maria says like he has a family here, and not just birds but all kinds. And then they do this three hundred and sixty degree uh, move with the camera to see everybody that's on Sesame Street, Muppets and humans. Well, they didn't hire enough extras that day. So suddenly, 
we all have to be in the shot to like fill the frame. So when Maria says we have all kinds, we have birds, we have cows, we have monsters. And then, you know, I'm looking at the screen and thinking, yeah, we have carpenters, we have prop masters, we have lighting directors, yeah. we, have, <laughs> we have Noel, we have Noel's mom, we have Debbie Spinney, the wife of Big Bird. We've got, so it's like all these people. So it was actually, it was an unintentional, but great tribute to all the people who actually made the movie are actually part of this grand finale scene. That's wonderful. Oh, wow. That's really cool. Yeah. Very cool. So speaking of international, for years, you've traveled to various countries training puppeteers for the international co-productions of Sesame Street. And there are a ton of them, people. Could you share any of your experiences from training these puppeteers? Um, Yes, because pretty much... uh, of all the puppeteers that I, I've trained, none of them have really been puppeteers previously. It's always been sort of actors who've been trained into doing it. I remember when um when I was asked to go to Japan to help uh, audition and train the new revised Japanese version of Sesame Street, um, they they had puppeteers come in like Boon Raku puppeteers, these older gentlemen. But we have to show people how to do monitor puppetry, the kind that, you know, Jim did and that we all learned from. And it really is that saying, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks because these gentlemen just didn't get it. But the the actors, the non-puppeteers did. Um, There was um, the um, Nigerian version of of Sesame, uh, Sesame Square. And I was auditioning um puppeteers in fact um rehearsal space is very like at a premium there so we were actually doing it in the lobby of the building of the production office and they set up like mirrors and so i remember um there was this one young lady who just had this like sort of like attitude like almost like being at a club and there's nobody to talk to and the mu- the music sucks and just like, why did I bother coming? And so I handed out, I, I had people go through the exercise with their bare hands. And she did it with like her hand on her hip. And it was like, okay, this won't last long. And then I handed out the puppets so that they could get used to the puppets and then have their turn with the mirror. So one group was already at the mirror, but I told them, here's a puppet, just get used to having it on your hand. And when I look back, Miss Attitude is actually talking very quietly to the puppet and the puppet very quietly talking back to her, having this little conversation. And suddenly that's when I just knew like, yeah, it's like she, she could actually do this. And she ended up actually getting the part. It was, it was like two, two puppet characters, a, a male and female character. And she got the female lead because you just never know. And that's the other thing. You could have like the greatest puppeteer since Frank Oz, like in that group, and with like, you know, six to eight months of training, they could be ready. But I don't have that amount of time. You never do. You have usually like that moment. And then you would have like maybe two, maybe three days to rehearse with these people and train them. And then bye. And then they would have to like practice and send tapes back for critiquing. So you really have to make sort of like a, a judgment call and see like the potential that's there. Um, but yeah, I've been to Nigeria, I've been to South Africa, I've been to Japan, been to Mexico, to uh, India, to Pakistan, to Palestine, to Jordan. Uh, yeah, it's been amazing. And it's, it, uh, it really is great. Because not only did I get to be um part of like the extending legacy of Sesame Street. And I always told the puppeteers that I auditioned and, and trained, like you're now part of this incredible legacy. But it's also just being exposed to so many different cultures and so many different people and how they live. And it's just, that's one of like the most gratifying things that uh, I take away from this. And I'm still in contact with so many of the, the puppeteers and the producers and writers that I got introduced to. <laughs> That's awesome. And yeah, of course, you're now uh, directing uh, 
Sesame, which is just really awesome. And you know, and recently you kind of um, recently done like, some Macy's Thanksgiving Day parades <laughs> for for Big Bird, which that was really awesome. Yeah, I get to my joke is with um, being Big Bird for the Thanksgiving Day parade. I I always joke I get to be a Big Bird before I go home to eat a Big Bird. So. <laughs> I like yeah, it. yeah, <laughs> exactly. Essentially, it's so yeah. true. <laughs> yes. <much>. So, yeah, <laughs> yes. Um. So and now, the- um, yes. Um. Now, uh, moving on from Sesame, you also got to play Magellan on the Nick Jr. series, Rika's Castle. Um. What's that kind of like for you, getting to perform more lead characters like Magellan? Uh, Magellan was my first like lead character of a of a series, and because he's puppeteered in the same style as Big Bird, I was able to to do it because Carol um, was not only a, a mentor, but a very dear friend. And I learned everything about body puppetry from him. And uh, so Magellan was great because you would put your, my I would put my right arm up through the neck into his head. And then my left arm would be in his left arm. And then you could have somebody be his right hand and then somebody be his tail. So there were moments when there was, you know, like three of us having this character come to life. The other characters were hand puppets. And in order for Magellan to be bigger, taller than the other characters, um, everybody stood on the floor with their arms up over their head and the, the set was raised up. So I was on these risers, these platforms that were linked together in, in like, you know, runway style. And with these boards on the side, so that I could feel them with my feet and not tumble over and like, you know, crush my coworkers. Yeah, another amazing <laughs> show. I absolutely love the Christmas special, Christmas at Eureka's Castle. Oh I yeah, Christmas at Eureka's special. Castle. Yes, so, so wonderful. Yeah, I got to uh, co-write it with uh, Jim Krupa and Brian Meal, who were the puppeteers on the show, with our head writer, uh, jovial Bob Stein, who. Went on to become R.L. Stein, yes. the great of those mm-hmm. Goosebumps series and things like that. And I, I hear he's done well by that. So, uh, oh yes, <laughs> yeah, quite well, very well indeed. So, yeah, uh, I think you can see. I think you can see Christmas on your Christmas Castle on YouTube. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah, it's you, on YouTube. Yeah, you yeah, YouTube. Yeah. yeah, YouTube's like the video junk drawer of the world. You can just like yes. type in almost anything. And somehow oh, yes. somebody has it up on YouTube. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that special. Mm-hmm. And you know, Rika's Castle is now on Paramount Plus. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is the first season, and uh, it's uh, the um, uh, the nice, neat half-hour versions of it. And what was yes. great about Eureka was um, was that there was really no curriculum. It wasn't like Sesame Street. It was just a bunch of like silly little skits and bits, which was so so. It was just like fun. Um, in terms of like, you didn't have to worry about, you know, what the lesson of the day was. So um, the first year, um, I just puppeteered. But for the second year, I became a writer uh, for the show, nice. which was great. Absolutely. So another lead character you got to perform was Leon on the Puzzle Place, which, of course, had a very diverse group of characters. Uh, what are your thoughts kind of about the show's lessons about diversity and representation because there were there were a lot of uh wonderful episodes on that show yeah it's almost like the puzzle place could actually like just air now you could probably just air those episodes and they would still hold up especially you know they the in, in the puzzle place this grand clubhouse that these kids would all like come together and play at uh was this ginormous screen this kind of like computer like screen called the Weebus. and whenever they wanted to call each other or call an expert on something. They would say, Weebus, please call, and it would pop up. So before Zoom, there was the Weebus, which is why, again, you could probably just air this right now, and kids would just think of it as a Zoom yeah. <laughs> call, you and, uh, and not just something yeah. like this weird kind of like thing. So, um, But yeah, we shot it in um, Los Angeles at uh, KTLA Los Angeles in the summer of uh, 1984. Oh, no, not summer. It was actually from like late winter through spring into summer of 1984. So 30 years ago. Wow, we're really going back here. And it premiered in, in January of uh, 1985. And it was myself, Peter Lentz, Jim Martin, uh, Allison Mork, season one, and then Stephanie DeBruso, season two, uh, Allison De- Alice Deneen, and Carmen Osborne. 
and we played these yes. very diverse characters who would from different parts of the country who would come somehow magically to, to this clubhouse and hang out and learn lessons about tolerance and respect and also have fun. So the first season, again, I was just a puppeteer, but for the second and third season, I became a writer uh, for the show. Yeah, you wrote a lot of uh, wonderful episodes of that show, too. Yeah, I'm Thanks. talking to you. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, that was uh, that, there was that one. There's one I put up on, on YouTube. It's um, the mystery of the fabulous hat. Yes. It's the one yeah, with, um, one. Yeah. with um, Leon trying to beat Sherlock Holmes and his friend Ben um, being coerced into being Dr. Watson. And then when Ben does a better job of finding clues, Leon fires him. But then Leon realizes that um, he can't do this by himself and wonders what he can do. And so that's when he goes to the Weebus and says, Weebus, please call the chief of the Acme Detective Agency. And at that time, yeah. the chief of the Acme Detective Agency was a character on another PBS show called Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego and was played by an actress named Lynn Thigpen. Yes. So before mm -hmm. Lynn and I talked as Bear and Luna, there was this conversation with Lynn's chief and my leon <laughs> that's right yeah mm -hmm. and when um when i when we are um got to know each other i reminded her of it and she totally remembered doing it yeah and then she also got to uh be on sesame street too lynn was a great character actress she was on sesame street she did uh broadway uh she was in movies she's the voice of the dj in the classic movie the warriors you never see her face but you just hear her voice and she told me how you know she was there for about like you know three to four hours and just like talking and then like that was it just like it was like a day's work <laughs> just like that's it <laughs> um and then um she, she was also on the the daytime uh, drama of all my children and uh, uh yes yeah, so, so she was a like consummate act, consummate actress she was really good as well as a very very dear person yes Absolutely. Absolutely. So speaking of respect, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a deep cut. Leon also got to appear on the special Kids for Character. Uh, we're going way back to 1996 on this one. Uh, <laughs> such a, it really, because you, you want to talk about a crossover, people. Like you had, it was insane. You had Barney. You had The Puzzle Place. You had Lamb Chop. You had The Magic School Bus. All these shows coming together and uh oh god there's one other one i know chris you have the tape i did not know about the back cover and i'm forgetting the name of the show now something story time kino story time i think it was yes which was also on yes. pbs in the 90s yeah. uh and there's a there's this really cool scene i've seen many times with leon and julie and barney and baby bob and bj something you just never see like it's really fascinating could you talk a bit about uh, kids for character yeah, it's like I actually barely remember it, but yeah, it's just like it was, it was one of those things where they just had all these like characters like come together for this cause. And I remember like one of the chief humans was Tom Selleck. Um, that's right. And then we we shot it, the actual video was shot at Universal Studios Florida and this grand like street scene. And so it was like Leon and and um, uh, Julie, played by Alice Deneen. But then we also would like with Barney and, and Baby Bob. So I have this picture of like this behind the scene picture of like Barney and Leon and uh, oh. together. And I've, I've oh, like wow. I, I had this great I've just had this control with Leon's like eyes and I'm having him like like bulge his eyes and like shock that he's like <laughs> like, <laughs> like next talking to, to this Barney. big purple dinosaur. <laughs> like, Huge. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, uh, Hello. Uh, yeah. So it's just like, so yeah. So it's like, and then, um, but that was like, like the first crossover. Then the next time there was a big crossover was um, We Are Family that uh, yes. Niles Rogers yes, put together. Yeah, I love that one too. Yes. Which was and we're, we're after 9-11. He had like human celebrities come together after 9-11. And then for the six month anniversary, there was a version for kids. And so they had the crossover from all the kids shows at the time, which included Bear. So there were moments where a lot of the characters were on each other's show. So it was such a great moment for me that 
I got to have Bear like be on Sesame Street and and Tutter too, next to Big Bird and Snuffy. These guys are used to like you know wrangle, and Bear is a you know is big. You know he's like you know he, he's a bear standing upright, but next to Snuffy and Big Bird, he's like a teddy bear next to these characters. Because suddenly he seems just so short <laughs> and so little. <laughs> Yeah. But it was really it was really it was really fun. It was it was great. And then for uh, making it available to schools, uh, they put it on um, a, um, a DVD and VHS. And so um, I got to write the script for it where um, Barney and Bear mm -hmm. are driving up to the school to yes. drop it yes, off. Yes, the FedEx truck and then go to the yeah. school and yeah, everything, you know. Hard. Yes. That, that's such yeah. a little neat thing. And yeah, you, exactly. So, Curry Stinson did that. Yeah, and then and then we did a little meet and greet with uh, kids afterwards in the auditorium and the kids were just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, <laughs> they could not believe, like, talk about worlds colliding. It was right. like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was yes. like funny. At the, at the end, it was like, um, I, I, I thought it'd be nice at the end, uh, as you see the the truck driving off, you hear Bear and Barney, and they, they, they. Uh, I thought, oh, you know, it'd be really fun to have like uh, Barney say, you know, it's like, by the way, Bear, you smell really good, <laughs> and Bear <laughs> says, oh, Barney, I love you, <laughs> and just like, well, we had to cut that <laughs> because apparently. Some folks at FedEx thought it was too suggestive. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And so it was cut. <laughs> it's like, eh, you know. uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that, so, that, that, that was fun. Yes, absolutely. So, and speaking of uh, Bear, of course, you know, one of your best known roles in the puppet world was getting to play bear on bear in the big blue house can you kind of describe how the show came to be and kind of like the audition process well it's like it's it's kind of <laughs> in terms of like the story it's kind of like it's kind of like the length it took to explain how i met your mother because it's it's over a course of a couple of years that it, it came to be first of all there was this guy jim henson and Jim decided that he wanted his characters to live on after he eventually like died, whenever that would be. And so he struck a deal with the Walt Disney Company and he knew Michael Eisner. They were friends from back when Michael Eisner was with ABC. And so they did this deal where Disney would buy the Muppets. Then, unfortunately, Jim died. And so that's when the deal got restructured and amended so that the Henson Company would still keep the Muppets, but they would develop three shows for Disney. One was a primetime series. The first one was called Dinosaurs. And that was the first show they developed under the deal. A couple of years later, the second show was a show called Alien in the Family. And it was about uh, an Earthling who marries an alien. And so it was kind of like, an, sort of an extraterrestrial version of the Brady Bunch, where the, the human kids and the alien kids are blended into this family. And in order to make that work, the baby alien, played by Dave Rudman, um, they had to set on the, this huge platform, so everything was raised up. So then I got canceled, uh, and they put everything in storage, including the raised platform, put a, put a pin in that. And so then they would do one more show. And rather than do something for primetime, they thought, let's do it for the new children's outlet of the Disney Channel, which was going to be called Playhouse Disney. And so they hired um, Mitchell Kriegman. And Mitchell was responsible for the show Clarissa Explains It All for Nickelodeon. So they hired him. And so he, as I was told, went through like the files and the drawers of Henson and see what ideas were there that hadn't been fully fleshed out and developed. And he saw this one, the sketch of this house with this bear. And originally the house was sort of a, a sentient being, like the house could like talk and all that. But he decided to focus on like this bear 
character and then developed uh, the other characters that uh, Bear would be friends with and that Bear would be the adult and these other characters would represent the kids at home. And so um, they had auditions for it and I got called in. And as soon as I walked in, um, executive Peter Van Roden at the time said to me right away, use your own voice. And I was like, what? It's like, we're the Muppets, we don't do that. And he was like, yes, but we just want Bear to have just a calming, normal voice. To contrast, another very large character who did not have that kind of voice, who I mentioned previously. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So so then I would like try and sneak in and no, no, no. So then I got into, uh, when I was inside, it was kind of like um, the helix. So it was like the, the, um, the under body of bear without the fur. It's just where I could see out. And it, there was a foam head and I could like manipulate it. And there was a, a, a camera and a big, large TV set, a monitor, so I could see what I was doing. And it felt really good. Even just like this sort of prototype, it's like, it felt really good. And then I thought, wait a minute, no, it's Friday. It's quarter to five. They called you in the last minute because they already picked out who they want and they just want to, you know, you know, make sure they made the right decision. So I said, eh, whatever. I'm just going to have fun knowing that I wasn't going to get this. So then that's when, you know, I was like running around and I was like jumping. And then one part of the script, it said that Bear sniffs the camera and or, 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 or uh, realize that it's the viewer. And so that's when I just jammed the nose all the way into the lens and then pulled it back and like jammed it in again and just like had fun. And then I just like, as we all should do with auditions, I said, thank you and completely forgot about it until that Monday when around six o'clock, I got a call from Henson saying, we want you to be bare. <laughs> and the rest, as they say, <laughs> is history. It is mm. history. Yes. 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 So, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Love Bear. I mean, it was one of the first shows I ever saw, like ever. At least what I was told. You got quite the collection back behind you too. I see, like, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's like, they, yeah, <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Bear and Washington. Um. So now, um uh, Yes, uh, I'm kind of curious. Were there any specific storylines or episodes on Bear you got to do that you're kind of that you're most proud of? Um, there was. Well, I got to again for the first season. I was the puppeteer, and the second season, I became a writer for the show. Uh, so there was um ones that I wrote that I that I particularly liked. Um, there was um there was the one where it's uh, called a uh, wait for me. And it was all about mm. being patient and just like waiting. Uh, um, another script that I didn't write, but I really liked was, uh, you know, the potty episode, which Classic. was so popular on yes. Amazon. And like yes. now people can like use it. And it's, it was like one of those things where, you know, Bear at the beginning um, said to the, to the crew, it's like, okay, the next three days, you're going to hear the following words. Poop, pee, potty, diaper, <laughs> wipe. <laughs> so get all the jokes out of your system now. <laughs> and now we can proceed. <laughs> yes. There's so many wonderful episodes. Like, and to all good night. Uh, this is your life there. Bears put the bash. Yeah. And one episode that would be Goper was actually uh, the, the character, the great Bandini. And of oh, course, yes. and of course, a Christmas special, a very bear Christmas. There's so many wonderful episodes. Yeah, it was like it was a really it was a really special uh, series. We we really had a good time because it was like the first time that um, me, Peter, Tyler Bunch, um, Vicky Eibner, um, oh, uh, uh, Jim Krupa, um, we uh, got to create like brand new Muppet characters because Barry and his friends are Muppets. They're not the Muppets. But they are Muppets. They are part of the Muppet verse. And so because people have asked me, he's like, does Bear know Kermit? And I would say Bear knows of Kermit the way I know of George Clooney. But I've never met him. <laughs> but 
but Kermit and the Muppets are these celebrities within this Muppet universe. So Bear would know of them, but he just has never met them. So, right. Absolutely, there there really were a lot of wonderful episodes. I was going to mention "Oh, Good Night" to you. Beat me to it, Jake. Thanks. <laughs> so, <laughs> Horses. <laughs> Horses. So you also got to sing a lot of um truly amazing songs as Bear on the show. Do you have any favorites in particular? Um, there's like um, there's like um, um, the song "Love." Love is love is uh what is it what is the exact title of this? It was just like love, love is, is love is the most no, love is the most amazing thing. It was that one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's the song "Picture This," which is just very sweet. There's a "That's My Name," which is like just uh, adorable. Yeah, that's a great with, one with the kids. And then uh, I got to uh, co-write a song for the show. I got, I wrote the lyrics, and Peter Lurie and I came up with the melody, and it's called "Come On In," and it's pretty much the entire synopsis of the show in this song from like beginning to end and um and so it was used as and became part of what we call the cycle songs where you would have a song that you could just easily just like drop into an episode so yeah. in order to help push the plot along or fill time so come on in you know clean up the house brush brush or breathe cha, cha, cha. <laughs> the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's just like Throw that in there. Song or... <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, one full, one full song. Right. And then of course, the too. you know, like of uh, like uh, of all the songs, there's that song that Bear and Luna would sing at the end of every episode, which yes. is is like the most, it's like the most beautiful, saddest song <laughs> for a children's show <laughs> ever. But it's it just is. gorgeous. It's just great. Peter's also responsible. He uh, also wrote. Um, the theme for the original series, The Magic School Bus. So Peter yeah. Lurie, and he was also the music director on Eureka's Castle. So he's he's yeah. done a lot. He current his current yeah. project here. has nothing to do with puppets or kids. Uh, he did the music for MacGyver the Musical, and the album is available online, and it's great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's wonderful. So we're gonna have a uh, special guest. Uh... Hopping in here, you may he may be familiar to you, and here he is. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome DJ Bob Runkel. Ah! <laughs> Bob! Hey, How you Bob. doing, Bob? Well, Hello, Bob. It's been a while. Hey, Bob. <laughs> when was the last time I talked to you? No, it's been a long time. Um. Yeah, I was like, I guess some point last year or in like, okay. but not on your, not on your podcast. I think just in general, but yeah, it's been a while. It's like, thought I, thought I kept you've been, up and, you've been, you've been a busy guy. guy. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> you've been, you've been racking up the guests on your podcast. Yeah. Yes, he has. <laughs> Going on our 14th yes. year. Can you believe that? Wow. Yes. Kudos. <laughs> Kudos nice. indeed. Who's some of the guests you've had, Bob? Oh my gosh. Um I've well just this past week Nate Spiegel and I interviewed a comedian who was on Craig Ferguson, his name is Josh Robert Thompson, and we kinda collaborated on that. That was a hmm. an hour and forty five minutes extravaganza. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's called part one and part two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, well, if it's any calculation, I asked Nate if we should do a part one and part two, and he's like, no, keep it all in. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Nate. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And, and you also had on Mr. Hugh Martin, the director. Yeah. Yes, we had him on too. Yes, yeah. we did. Yes, we yes, did we as did. well. Yeah. Love yeah. Hugh so much. He's just the best. He's yes. a jerk. <laughs> it's finally coming out now you know this, uh, this whole persona this nice guy it's an act uh, <laughs> oh, man. yeah did, yeah Hugh directed all the episodes of uh Eureka's Castle both here in New York and then we, when we went to Orlando Florida and also shot the uh the Christmas special as well as two other specials uh don't look under the bed and um, another one 
And of course, that, a lot, a lot, most of the episodes for season one of Bear too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we did one more with a special with Luther Vandross, but forget the name of it. it but, we, oh, yeah, well. I'm, I'm trying to remember. It the name we, um, of it too. Um, don't um, don't touch, don't that, touch box. that box. Don't touch that box. Okay. Yes. Yes. I had to dig in yeah. my roller. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I, I, like, I know. What I was too. it called? Yeah. So yes, yeah, so we did those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did those three specials plus uh, the second half of season two down in Orlando, which was quite the experience. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yes, that's wonderful. Yeah, and there, there. Going back a bit to bear episodes, I also like the uh, the birthday episodes. Which one? Oh yeah, the, there were a yeah, lot of those. Mouse there party, was a few of birthday bash. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yes, you... when in doubt, celebrate somebody's birthday. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Like, yes. Whose birthday yes. is it today? And yes. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, um, grandma, and grandma Flutter's one hundredth birthday. Grandma Flutter's one hundredth. Yeah, that was different because you don't really talk about grandparents like no. aging right on yeah kick TV. That was no, kind of cool no, approach. yeah. It was it was our way of celebrating the 100th episode of yeah, that's, there, so that's, that's why we that's right. wow. had it be 100 years. But we did do an episode about grandparents. That was Grandma yeah. Etta and Grandpa Otto, yeah. played by oh, Vicky and true. Jim Krupa, which was great. And they have and that's another great song. Um, your 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 grandma and grandpa. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. it's and one. it's a really it's a really sweet, cute song about grandparents. Yeah, because you really don't because um that was the one nice thing about Bear was that he was. Um, an adult. He was an adult character because so many kids shows the lead characters are kids, but Bear was an adult, so it was great when he would like make appearances on things like Hollywood Squares, and he could be, you know, a little bit more cheeky, a little yeah. more of a yes. more yes. of a wink. <laughs> kind of goes slightly responses. off the rails a little bit when one yeah, of the yeah. appearances. Yeah, it was just a, a very gentle, yeah. like little wink, and like yeah, and Bear also. Um, you know, he would come in and like the living room would be a complete disaster thanks to Pip and Pop. And you know, he would <laughs> he would, you know, occasionally do these asides to the camera with that look of like, you know what I'm going through. And if someone online actually commented how much they appreciated like that sort of like bear breaking the fourth wall for parents of like, I know I know what you're feeling right now. <laughs> and he <laughs> no. even I, he yeah. even said haven't you been through this too? Like there are times where he yeah. looked the camera yeah. and so we yeah. addressed it. That's what made Bear so great because it resonates with kids and parents. And oh, there's yeah. not a there's there's not a lot of kids shows that kind of do that. Yeah. No. The, the latest mm -hmm. one is Bluey now on on Disney yes. Plus. So oh, I love Bluey. Bluey. It's enjoyable yeah. for for parents too. So it's like yeah. So but before that there was Bear. And actually, it's funny like on uh. The listing on Disney Plus, they'll have uh, you know, like Disney Junior. I'll have like you know Bluey, and then right next to Bluey is Bear, and then then you just like keep swiping oh, over. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, so it's just like yeah, so it's it's yeah. very funny. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, I love where Bear doing kind of some like like appearances and like in talk shows and even oh, yeah. like Walt Disney World Christmas Day Parade. And you know, and Breakfast with Bear is kind of a you know, neat little you know show. And of course, now Bear is now on Disney Plus. Yep. Yes, really awesome. finally, yes, he's finally, right. he, yes. yes. I mean, for so many years, people would like, you know, you know, tweet me on like, like Twitter, just like, it's like, they should put Bear on. It's like, it's like, you should tell them to put Bear on. It's like, yes. Bear should be back on. And it was like, and it was like, you know, it was just like adorable because you think that I actually have all this power at my disposal because, you know, if it were up to me, it never would have left the air. But <laughs> right? thank you so much that I should just call Disney and say, hey, put it on. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, Bear's now on Disney Plus. But there, apparently there's like seven episodes missing. So now I'm getting tweets about like, it's like, where are the episodes? No, it's like, <laughs> oh. they should put those episodes. On. They're missing like this, this, this and this. Yeah. And it's like, again, one of the one of the weirder <laughs> ones they're making is the the second part of the Christmas special. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And it's like they it's like it's like they should put those on. It's like, yes. Yes, they should. <laughs> Thank you for writing. <laughs> yeah, right. I didn't bug you about it. I was the one that told you about. It. Yeah, exactly. No, yes. Yeah. Exactly. So it was just like, no. So and, and to date they still haven't put it on. Why? Again, folks, I don't 
no. <laughs> it's not like they, it's not like there's saying. music rights issues. There was no yeah. Bear didn't do any covers of anything. No, exactly. Not so really, it's just like, really. yeah, I don't know. It's like because one of the reasons why it took so long was because it they had to transfer the original you know series that right you know it was 1997 into like 4K like you know digitize it, but not only visually but also the audio. They had to go back and also update all of the audio. And then not just for the English audio, but for all the translated languages out there that are now yeah. watching Bear. There were again. a lot of episodes so, of Bear, too. There were like 117 yeah. like or 18. 17, of, yeah. 17 uh -huh. episodes. How many, Bob? How many exactly? <laughs> <laughs> They're right. There you go. There you go. Anyone would know it's Bob. I have yep. no memory. Yeah. People would yes. ask me, say, Oh, I, I, it's like, oh, I love this song. I love this episode. That, yeah, that's great. great. I have Gar no memory garbage whatsoever. memory. You put <laughs> like garbage memory. Bob, no. like Bob's out the no yeah. knows it. He knows it. Yes. Oh yes, it's like it's like I'm, oh, yeah. I've been on the show way too many times, so he's heard the same stories over and over again. Well, so. you, you, you got to come back. <laughs> you got to talk about little shop. <laughs> yes, the other thing I've been like dabbling in the world of theater. I've, the, yes. And the swing puppeteer and swing voice for the plant Audrey Two for Off Broadway's Little Shop of Horrors. So, which is uh, currently our current Seymour is Darren Chris, and our current Audrey is Evan Rachel Wood. And they are fantastic. Not only great performers, but just wonderful people. It's so much fun to, to hang out with. So, if you're in New York, between now and the end of March, you can come and see Darren and uh, Evan in Off Broadway's Little Shop of Horrors. I bet some of them grew up, grew up watching you, like poor Ben. Well, Harry. well, when I started, I started at Little Shop in October of 2022, and at that time, the Seymour was actor Rob McClure, who uh, has been in Broadway's Beetlejuice, and he originated the role of Mrs. Doubtfire, which is which he's on tour right now and uh, won and, and got a Tommy nomination for it. So he was the current Seymour when I came in. And so he's, he's done theater and he's so incredibly talented. He was fanboying over me when he found out who I was and what I did <laughs> in particular, how he grew up watching Eureka's castle <laughs> <laughs> and that I was Magellan and he could not believe it. So for his uh, going away present, I had one of those little uh, Magellan rubber Pizza Hut toys, oh. and and I gave it to him, and the man oh. nearly cried. Oh. <laughs> he just like loved it. Of, there you get a picture yeah. of him nearly on his knees. Good. Yes, yes. It's like it's 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 great. He's just like wonderful, and Rob is like such such a great guy. He's like one of the nicest uh, performers that I've I've met. <laughs> um, yeah, but it is, it, is, it is funny that, you know, this Broadway star was like fanboying over me. So <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Oh, that's great. I feel like a proud dad around these guys. Because... <laughs> yeah. That feels weird. <laughs> <laughs> He'll have notes for you. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know. Um, so going back to Disney for a, for a moment, you were working on the Book of Pooh puppeteering Rabbit, which you had brought up uh, tabletop puppetry earlier. Uh, could you kind of talk about working with tabletop as opposed to Muppet-style puppetry? Yeah, it's a tabletop, or um, in Japan it's called Bunraku. And yep. so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a team of puppeteers to bring one character to life. And so traditionally, there'd be a puppeteer to do the head, and then there'd be another puppeteer to do, um, in Japan, like, the right hand and right arm and another puppeteer for the left hand, left arm, and then people for the feet. And you could be doing this as a team for years. It's like, and so um, for the book of Pooh, it was against a green screen. And so we all wore these green smocks and green hoods and green gloves. And the hundred acre wood was virtual uh, and projected so that uh, we could see it on the monitors, even though behind us, we were like all green and the tables were green. But if you look to the monitor, they were standing on the ground and 
in front of Pooh's house. And I was Rabbit. And so I did the head and I held the body of Rabbit. And Paul McGinnis did oh, yeah. the arms of Rabbit, which had these great little triggers for flicking his, his wrists. And Matt, um, Matt Brooks, who designed and built Rabbit, did the feet. Hmm. And so we, we were you know, Team Rabbit. I wasn't the voice. Right, None of yeah. us were the voices of the characters because yeah. they did a test with Pooh, Piglet, and Tigger. One with the puppeteers doing the voices and then one with the known animated voiceover artists dubbing in. And they showed both versions to kids. Kids didn't care. They just wanted to see more and wondered where you know the other characters were. When they showed it to parents, particularly moms, who buy the products, the mom said, oh, that's not how I remember Pooh sounding when I was little. And so that's why the voiceover guys got to do it. And we just lip synced along. But occasionally if we added a line, then they would have to go back and uh, dub in what we had, had said. Uh, the best part of the book of Pooh was meeting all these incredible puppeteers I'm still friends with. Uh, Matt, uh, Matt Brooks, um, Paul McGinnis, Amanda Maddox, Jen Barnhart, James Godwin, uh, Robin Howard. I love Jen, James. <laughs> yeah, yes. a lot of wonderful yes. names. Yeah. Yes, it's just like, and it's like because of this show, I've I've met these people, and I'm still like friends with all these people. Love these people. Um, yeah, so that was the best part of the the Book of Pooh was meeting all the and all these and and all these people. I'd never done like real TV puppetry before. So this was their intro into like TV puppetry and, and using a monitor because they primarily done like theater. So me, Tyler, Peter, and Eric um, Jacobson were like yeah. the principals for Pooh, Rabbit, Tigger, um, and Piglet. And so we had we so that's why we were the heads and all that because we knew monitor puppetry, but Bear was still like, um, still being shown, and I would still do appearances every now and then to promote the show. So I would leave, and so that's when, um, Paul McGinnis would get a chance to do the head of Rabbit, and then even Matt Brooks got a chance, and Matt always thanked me for the fact that I trusted them with this character and let them do it. I said, I said, of course, that's how you go. To, that's the only way you're going to learn is by doing it. So just like do it, you know, pick a show that's not like challenging or anything, but it's like, if rabbit's there and he's standing and he's listening and it does a reaction, like, yeah, try it, do it. And so, yeah, it was great. So got a whole new crop of like TV puppeteers, which was wonderful. Yes. Also, yeah, Bugapoo, a uh, one for series. Um, so now, uh, also, also on Disney Plus. <laughs> yes. 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 In, yes. In, in its entirety. Yes. No, there are no, no missing episodes. episodes. No, no episodes yes. missing on that one. No. All episodes are actually on there. But how exactly. about how about Bear? Uh, how about Bear? No, 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 no. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, because of just... that, we're taking five more off. <laughs> right. We went through this discussion earlier, Jake. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> so, now, uh, all, now all we need is breakfast with Bear on Disney Plus. That would be great. Like, uh... Yeah, that'll never happen. Oh, yes. <laughs> I don't know. You never know. <laughs> But that's also on YouTube. I think occasionally yeah. you can see some of those, and that and that yeah, was yeah. great. It was like it was like the unofficial spinoff of, of Bear. Mm -hmm. It was like wraparounds for a block of shows that were on from seven a.m. to eight a.m. Um, but Bear would be in the real world with yeah, real kids pretty, really in, the, awesome. in their in their real homes, and so yeah. we did we did some like um, a bunch in New York, and then another bunch in uh, Los and um. California in Los Angeles area. Uh, one was in um, Fort Irwin, the military base in the, in the middle of the Mojave Desert. And um, Bear, like, in the opening, Bear, like, gets out of this, like, you know, you know, army helicopter and with his little song, like, hey, it's a brand new day. But it's like, <laughs> and then uh, you see him go up to the door and say he's he's going to have breakfast with like so and so, 
And then I ad libbed Barrett turning around saying, it's hot, but it's the dry heat. And then <laughs> going and in, going inside. So there were different segments. And one of the segments was Bear and the kid at the breakfast table and the kid and Bear um, talking about what the kid likes to eat. And then suddenly the phone rings and we have to stop recording and the mom answers and we can hear her say, hi, no, no, I can't talk right now. No, no, Bear's in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, I'll call you back later. <laughs> and she was like, I'm, I'm so sorry. And she was like, came back, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, that's my husband. And I said, as you know, Bear says, your husband who's in Afghanistan right now? And she said, yes. And Bear's like, call him back. We'll wait. It's okay. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah, Breakfast with Bear is, 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 a, is an awesome little, little, little show, which is really awesome. Yeah. With Bear in the real world, which is awesome. So now, oh, um, yeah. now uh, you also worked on a knocking series, Ubi, as one of the main characters, Keiko. Uh, what was it like? Work on that. On the show Ubi, yes. Yes. Ubi, this little fever dream of puppetry. Uh, this <laughs> basically, it's a, uh, it's basically our bare hands with glass eyes on them. Yep. That's what that what that was the puppets. And they started off as interstitials, little things in between um, noggin shows, and then it became its own series. Um, and it was myself as uh, Ubi's best friend Keiko. And Ubi was played by Tim Legas. Love and, Tim. Tim, and, uh, yes. And Tim. Tim's little sister, Uma, was played by Stephanie DeBruzzo. And Grandpa Love was Stephanie played by too. Tyler Bunch. Yes. And yep. then I got to be Keiko, his friend, uh, who wore a little red hat. And Keiko's little catchphrase was, you, Ubi, friends, perfecto. Mwah. Because they only talked in one or two words at a time. And so, and there's... I don't remember her name. However, when you get a chance after this podcast, go to YouTube, type in Ubi History, and this young woman will pop up who is going into not a deep dive. We're talking James Cameron down to the Titanic level of figuring <laughs> out the sheer logic of this show. <laughs> it's commendable. And frightening at the same time. <laughs> the thought that goes into it. <laughs> I saw it. I, saw, I see it. Uh, I see it. It's <laughs> astounding. <laughs> and I truly encourage you, if you are a fan of movie, to check out this young woman's like like channel. Because it is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be lo- Things lo- I lo- never this- thought of or wanted to think about. But it's like, you know what? She has a point. <laughs> Ubi Lord, and this is out of hand. I, I, think what, I, I think that's what I think that's what, I think that's what, I think that's what the video you're talking about. Twenty-two, yeah. <laughs> 22 minutes. Yes, 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 oh, yes, yes. Twenty-three minutes. Yes, yes Bob. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I saw it. Oh, wow, that's great. That's awesome. Yes, it's amazing. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. So uh, you were also a temporary host for the Sprout Block the Good Night show, playing Leo the Night Gardener for a very short amount of time. But uh, yes. could you kind of talk about uh, what that experience was like? Um, Noggin was this, it was like Sprout. Yeah. Uh, was this mm-hmm. collaboration, PBS Sprout. So it was like a collaboration between like Sesame Workshop and... Um, Nickelodeon, like all these shows are on there. And so, so Sprout was like, was born somehow. And it was run by um, Andrew Beecham, who ran um, the British um, Playhouse Disney division. And so we got to know each other because I would go over with Bear and make appearances on um, their like uh, morning block of, uh, of, of, uh, children's shows they would have these hosts and and wraparounds for their block of shows which included bear so andrew and i got to know each other so then andrew came over and he took and he took charge and for the good night show um the original host uh, um was there and he asked me if i would uh direct and i was like sure i would love to so i directed the first season of the good night show then the host left and so they were having another host come 
But for the interim, for one month, they needed a, a host. And so he asked me, would I be interested? And I said, oh, directing the, the new host? And he said, no, to be the host. And I was like, oh, because he figured like, you know, since I was Bear and Bear was a host, I could have that same sort of kind of like persona, but as me. And I was like, um, okay. So I became Leo, uh, the gardener of uh, sort of like the Sprout uh, Good Night Show, which was yeah. a show that this um, wraparounds in the evening from like six until nine. Yeah, and then like it that, would just yeah. and then yeah. it would just repeat, and then it yeah. would just repeat because of like the you know the the time blocks across the country, um, and you would like uh, there would be games, there'd be songs, there'd be crafts, there'd be like little uh, stories, and then all the intros to uh, um, to, to the show like Sagwa the the cat and yeah for Nadi. Uh, uh, yeah, not dragon even, tales, yes. uh, you dragon, know. Dragon. yeah, that kind of thing. Um, so it was weird for me because I was playing a human, and so right. occasionally, and and Andrew actually directed me, and so I would see the camera, but I, I would also see the monitor. So occasionally, I would like look at the monitor. And Andrew said, "No, you're looking at the monitor," <laughs> because <laughs> out of habit, I would just like look at the monitor. Happy, yeah. yeah. So then I got yeah. to. Um, I then got a picture of my son who was a baby at the time. And so I taped it to the, to the camera. So this way, whenever I looked at the camera, I could immediately see his face. And so I was like talking to, to him, which was always my philosophy that it's not a camera. It's actually a kid you're talking to and one who's never seen this show before. So that like helped yeah. a lot. So it was very interesting playing a human being. Oh, yes. uh, there was, there yeah. were puppets it's, on it's it. It's there yeah, 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 I'm. St yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I mean, I'm really. It's, human. it's an it's yeah. an evil, you know, no, no. Yeah, and um, there was, for the, and there was a puppet, like there was a, a star, yeah. right. Stacia, Stacia Newcomb, love Stacia so much. Yes, she's, she's great, you know. and she played Star, which was kind of a, a star shaped yes. clue. And then there was, yes. um, and then yes. there was, a, yes, it did. And then there was a firefly who mm -hmm. would like yeah, flutter um, through uh, 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 Lucy, Lucy, yeah. yes, and she would like flutter and like, yeah, and uh, and glow, uh. Yeah. So yeah, but, yeah, and I um also wrote like a lot, yeah. a lot of the wraparounds as well. Yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah, this one, that's right. Yeah, and then I found I found like the the file of it, and so I like uploaded like me singing like um the opening and closing song, and people went nuts. Yeah, just like <laughs> this, like you'd think like the Holy Grail had suddenly been I have found. A, I have a, I have a <laughs> story about that. Like, like what? Bear was on the was on Sprout. <laughs> exactly. He, he, he was a <laughs> like, human on that Sprout. Like, I, I have a story what about. Is my oh world my right gosh! Now? What's your story, Bob? A what couple, is your story, Bob? Like a couple years ago, you sent me this. You sent me this mysterious package with DVDs, and then you're like, "Can you do something with this?" So it's every episode of that. And you're like, can you convert these for me? So it's basically my fault. That... <laughs> no fault. Bob. No, no fault. No, no fault at all. Like there are Sprout fans who are eternally oh, yeah. thanking you for yeah. this. I was this not. Moment. Oh, yes. I, I wasn't yes. Oh, for that. Thank you. There. Thank you for that, Bob. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they mean like, like do this. It was just like watching again. Like, it was like, okay, yes, this, this was an interesting experience. <laughs> and it's like, and and where is Leo now? <laughs> where is he now? Oh well, where is he where now? Is he now? Well, probably still doing things in front for the garden, but just just somewhere else. Just somewhere else. It's just like maybe just like... maybe a different garden. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Pretty much. Pretty much. So now, um, uh, you inherited the war of a uh, lion and lion during the last two seasons of PBS series Between the Lions. What well, we went into kind of taking on that character. Um. Uh, basically, um, the original uh, puppeteer um, uh, left, and so they they were yeah, going Anthony back. Asbury, into... uh, yes. Anthony Asbury, he's the best. Yes, and they were going back to do uh, the last two seasons um, in Jackson, Mississippi. So uh, I auditioned for it, and I got it because um, Lionel was very much in um, the vein of Leon from the Puzzle Place, being a little smart aleck, a little cheeky. 
um, a little bit of a, you know, a wise guy. And so I just like used that and it was great. It was a great puppet. Puppets were built by uh, three design studio, which was Jim Krupa's company with his yeah. partners, John Orberg and Matthew Stoddard and Kip Rathke. Um, they also did the puppets for Eureka's castle. So these puppets are gorgeous. Um, yeah. And it was, it was great. We, we were down in um, Jackson for a couple of months and we did, and it, we did it in Jackson, Mississippi, because to do the last two seasons, um, they needed uh, funding for PBS shows. And so WGBH, who was the main partner, put up money, but they still needed more money. So then um, the public television of Jackson, Mississippi, um, put up Mississippi Public Television, put up the rest. Because of the fact that at that time, um, there was a high level of illiteracy in the state of Mississippi. And they thought that between the lines, a proven record of helping kids learn to read would also help adults learn how uh, to read. And so that's why we went to uh, Jackson, Mississippi, which is a, a wonderful town. It's, it's, it's wonderful. And I, I had a great time in Jackson. The people there were great. Stu was wonderful. Um, yeah, and it was fun. And then um, I uh, was doing um, a promotion for my book. I wrote a book called 10 Minute Puppets about yeah, how to yeah, make puppets yeah. in 10 minutes. Yep, and so right, right, I yeah. asked if I could use uh, Lionel for, there, there, for there my is. appearances. My and he said, and Chris Surf said, sure. So I got Lionel. And then um, I said, when do you want him back? And he was like, oh, you know keep them. If I ever need them, I'll let you know. So, so I have Lionel, like, and Pam Marciero, who was, uh, Leona, she has Leona and, mm -hmm. uh, Jen Barnhart has Cleo, the mom. And, and, and then Peter, Peter and Peter did. Peter has Theo. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and an Elcher bunny. He still has an so Elcher bunny too. Yes. 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 That's awesome. Yeah, so we all have the puppets. <laughs> yeah. I was kind of, I was kind of wondering Standing about by. that. I was kind of wondering about that because I know there's been some things recently with uh, Cleo and Theo, like they've kind of yes. come back. So, and I saw that Lionel was the only one who we haven't really seen any yeah. new stuff with in a while. So I was just wondering if that yeah. puppet's Chris, like still around. Chris had contacted me saying, he's like, you still have Lionel? It's like, of course I still have Lionel. It's like, it's not on eBay. Of course I still have Lionel. <laughs> so <laughs> and so, uh, oh, so he's awesome. going to contact me about like, new content i was like sure that's great I, so. ooh, ooh. when i met you when awesome. i met when i met you know in person when we finally met lionel we there we hung out with lionel for a little oh, bit oh yes. that's that's great. Great. i didn't know that wow that's that, that's wow. really cool that's, that, that's yeah awesome. yeah a lot of people yeah it's like the pbs like people know about bear or eureka's castle but a lot of people don't know about um the puzzle place or even like between the lines, but the puzzle place in yeah. particular because because of yeah. the fact that Bear and Eureka's Castle being on networks like Nickelodeon and Disney, they were on at specific times. But your local PBS station creates their own schedule. So yeah. the puzzle yeah. place could have been on at 7.30 in the morning before school or 4 o'clock in the afternoon after school. But if it or was not, on... Or not at all. Or not at all. Yeah. Yeah. But if yeah. it was on at 10 o'clock in the morning... You never saw it, so right. yeah. a lot of kids yeah. just you know, don't know. Yeah, and, and Jen kind of talked to us about about you know, like a where where some people don't don't didn't have didn't watch Between Lines because but other no they know about Wing Rainbow or something. But yeah, it, but same reason. Where, yeah, where, yeah. Where's where where Jen Lily said this that Between Lines are best <laughs> one best, best, kid, best, best, best kids best, that you never probably heard of. never heard of. Yeah, exactly. her words, not ours. Yes, <laughs> yes. You're, you're very welcome, Jen, for yes, mentioning yeah. that. We'll we'll pay you royalty <laughs> soon for that. <laughs> yeah, between lines, it's a wonderful show. You teach them lines. Oh yeah, about reading. Yeah. You know, hey, it's wonderful. Oh, yeah. The theme hey. song's great. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. My gosh, I love yes. that theme. Yes. Yeah. I love that show. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes. Were, were you were you gonna say something, Bob? I was gonna say that that show lasted ten years, and a lot of people don't know. A lot of people don't know its whole history. The people that yeah. I know that watch it 
stopped at a certain point and didn't even know that it had such a rich history for Between the Lions. Yeah. Right. And the development that went behind it, too, because I remember in the past when we talked to uh, Chris and Norm and they kind of talked about how uh, it took a couple years for them to really develop the show and get it to what it is. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, people don't realize in, in terms of, like, children's TV, I mean, any TV, but in particular children's TV, how long it takes. Because, first of all, you have to, like, pitch an idea to the right people who realize, oh, yes, this would be a good idea. And then you just don't start, like, next week and start, like, shooting it. You have to go through this development process. And then there's, like, testing to see if, like, it actually works. Yeah. And then there's setting up a schedule of, like, shooting and like where to shoot it shoot it and like hiring a crew and the and all of it and then there's post-production after you got everything together and so it takes a while for a kid show to uh to get off the ground so yeah so mm -hmm. going back briefly to your film work what was it like assisting Raphael in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 um that was that was great it was uh the third movie it didn't involve the the Jim Henson company. It uh, had a, a different company that that did it, um, but using a very similar uh, technology that the, the Hensons had done, so that it was all remote control. So the heads of the turtles were remote controlled, and I uh, puppeteered the head of Raphael, and then Leo and Donnie and Mikey were puppeteered remotely by. Jim Martin, Gordy Robinson, and Rick Lyon. And, oh, Rick, right. yes. Yes. And then uh, inside the Turtles were these actors. And I looked out and had uh, uh, Matt Hill, who's an actor. I love from, Matt. From, from, love Matt from, so from much. From Canada. Such dear yeah, Matt, yeah such, Matt's my such boy. Such a wonderful guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's great. And he's uh, done voiceover work uh, for the or uh, this, this, um, the cartoon uh, Ed, Ed, uh, Eddie. And, and, uh, yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and yeah, he's, he's great. great. He's doing, he's going to be starting doing like uh, Comic-Con conventions because voiceover actors are like huge now at Comic-Cons. Yeah. I'm doing Comic-Cons um, conventions, pop culture conventions again. And the voiceover actors get huge amount yeah, of voice people actors come to see them. them. Yeah. It's oh, like, oh, that's awesome. awesome. That's awesome. Amazing. Kind of start doing yeah. that. And yeah, some of the puppeteers yeah. too, because I know uh, Steve Whitmire and Kevin Clash, they've done a lot of those too. And, and, yeah. and you've done some of those too. Yep, yeah. Yes. And the people yeah, want yeah. to take a picture of Bear. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know. I have like a little version of Bear as if he got. Yeah, like a dryer. smaller version of Bear. Yeah. 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 And so, right. yeah, I've got, I've got, I, I, I did one. Um, I did two last year. Uh, I've got another one coming up, one coming up in um, September in, in Orlando, Orlando Con. So I'm doing that. Awesome. And, so, nice. and, and between that, there may be like a couple of others. So just like finding out and like uh, availability and like signing stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. There was one that Matt Hill was at like a couple months ago in my yeah. area, like two minutes from my house. He's like, can you get, can you get no to come to? <laughs> <laughs> at this point, like with, Comic Cons now. There's a chance you know I might run into each other, which would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely. Your turtle you know, bro for sure. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yes, absolutely. Yes, yeah. yes. You, yes, you and you and you and Matt. Oh yeah, we, we hit it off like so <laughs> well, and I was like so jelly... grateful. <laughs> that was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Yes, <laughs> sure. <laughs> I guess. Yes. So now, uh, moving on from a puppeteering, you also wrote for some other children's series, including the Magic School Bus, Google Island, and the Cyber Chase. Like, can you talk about about your kind of work doing those in particular? Yeah, it's like um, the Magic School Bus and Cyber Chase, they were animated shows, so not puppetry. And the thing about that is with a with script, like with like any like puppet show, like with the puzzle plays, um, you know, interior puzzle plays, day the kids are sitting around uh the table like ben like what do what should we do leon's like i don't know how about play some checkers julie oh we did that yesterday suddenly nuzzle and sizzle the dog and cat race through frame and so it's basically just like a blueprint of like what the director could then do in terms of like the shots like what shots do you want to start off with a wide shot and then go to a two shot or 
a close up of them talking and then a wide shot again. But with animation, the writer actually gets to play the director. So you actually get to not only describe the scene, but describe the shot. So I wrote uh, two scripts for the Magic School Bus, and one was called The Magic School Bus Sees Stars. And it's pretty much like, you know, opening exterior, school, uh, sunset, camera pushes in as we dissolve to interior, classroom, and blah, 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 overhead shot, panning down. And just like, you have to write out everything because then the animators take this and they do exactly what's written in terms of like close-ups, overhead, um, panning over, like tighten it, all of that. And so that's what that was what's so um, incredible about it. You got and I was like shocked, like, oh my gosh, they actually wrote everything that they actually animated everything I described, which was wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, and Gullah Island, which you wrote for, is a wonderful show, too. Yeah. Yeah, I only wrote, wrote one script for that, but um, it's, it's the, the Magic Show one. And yes, uh, that was fun. Good one. Yes. Yeah. I was, I was talking to Leslie about an animated show that you wrote Leslie. that never got, that never aired, Nate the Great. What was that? Oh, yeah. So... It, it was it was trying to this was a show trying to do an animated version of the kid series Nate the Great about this kid who was like a, a detective and solving crimes for his friends and I wrote for it and it just didn't happen it's just like for some reason it just it just didn't Leslie happen. Because did, Leslie did voices on it. We were talking about it. She was like really excited to see it. And it never yeah, and out. it never it never happened. So yeah, so so many times like some of these things like, you know, it'll get, you know, produced to a point of being like a test um, for development, and it just just wasn't just didn't work. So yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. She even mentioned that Hugh Martin's wife worked on it too. Yes, Kristen. Yes, she worked on it. She was a executive producer. Yes. Yes. So before we uh, wrap up here, I do also want to briefly mention uh, one of your other projects you worked on recently, which is your memoir. Hey, this was really fun, which I love. I have yes. a copy of it uh, right here. Me, thank me God. too. It's me like, too. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah, Can yeah, I just yeah, apologize? Yeah, yeah, I just yeah, apologize for it. everybody who hasn't gotten their, their copy yet because here's the thing. Don't ever work with Amazon Publishing. It's like, it's the worst. It's just like, it's just, it, it takes so long in oh, yeah, getting the I'm things published. published. Yeah. I'm, I'm publishing yeah, it right now too. And it's just like, I am, it's like, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> it's mm. like, it's going on a year and I'm still like doing updates. Hey, another shipment just went out. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, What's a good book? I actually recently finished uh, reading it. And I'm gonna me too. Read me it too. A such a, such amazing read. It really mm -hmm. is. No, it, it really, yes. really is. And yeah, to, thank you. And and um, and, and, uh, and to those you know who, who, who were Gosh. fans of you know his work that you know that's been you know and who just want to know more about his life, pick up a copy of it. It's a it's a really yeah. it's a really just good do read. It. Just do it. <laughs> just do it. <laughs> just do it. Like uh, Nike does. Just do it. Just do it. Yes. Right. It's on yes. Amazon. Yes. Leave a review. Like, like, let me know if yeah. you liked it or not. This is like, I, leave a review. Oh, oh, we think it's just such. It's it, so yeah. amazing. I would love Thank it if you. there we was an audio. I would love it if there was an audio book too. Yeah, I am working on that with our friend Nate uh, Beagle. Um, nice. We are we are working awesome. on the audio book, so I I I've done half of it, and I'm about to do uh, the other half. So it will be coming. It will be coming in the future. Nice, awesome. awesome. And and great. recently, yeah, I actually got to do um uh, things for a little shop of horrors too. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I'm like the swing puppeteer and swing voice now, which is great. I started in October of 2022, and I'm still there. So yeah. they still like me. I've um, never <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> I've never seen you more comfortable in like a place where you're at. I oh, feel like the, it's the, really like a family there. And oh yeah, it's 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 amazing. My my joke is um, whenever you, if you've ever seen like the Tony Awards, mm -hmm. people on stage always mention community. The word community. Theater is such yeah. a community. Oh, this community. I'm so proud to be a part of this community. There's nothing like this community. If you 
did a drinking game every time somebody said community. <laughs> You would have alcohol poisoning by the time they mention best musical. <laughs> <laughs> Probably even But here's that. the thing. <laughs> it is absolutely true. It's like yes. theater people are amazing because they all know each other. They've all worked together somehow. Off Broadway, Broadway, regional, touring. They know this person, they know that person. Both on stage, off stage, crews know each other, producers know each other. In fact, um um, I was talking to one of the actors and uh, I said, like, you really probably need to have a good reputation because y'all know each other so well. And he said, yeah. And he said, like, he was part of a show where there was a, a performer who was very gifted, but they could be very difficult at times. So then um, the show closed and all that. And so at, some, at one point, uh, another show was being like um developed and what people do is they go to a table and producers and and director and people sit down and they go through like who do you think we should contact to go up for this part and this performer from this particular show's name came up and somebody at the table had also worked on that show backstage and said oh no you don't want this person. And here's why. And pretty much listed the difficulty moments. And that person's name was just tossed aside. So you really have to like be the consummate professional. Like, you know, show up on time, leave your baggage at the door, know your lines, and you know, be respectful and courteous. Because that's that's what people will hear about. They want people. You want to work with because you know shows you know some shows could go on for you know years little shop had, um started in the fall of 2019 up until march of 2020 then something happened yeah. and then it came and then came back in the fall of 2021 and it's still going and right now it's going until january of next year so you really want people you want to work with not have to work with especially exactly. with this theater yep. yeah especially with this theater because like you know it's very intimate like the guys in the girls dressing room it's like just one room and so it's like you can't there's no there's hardly room for like seven guys let alone an ego coming in as well and so you 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 really do learn to just like get along and you know, the Seymours that we've had, that I've gotten to, to know and work with for my time there, Ron McClure, Matt Doyle, um, Jeremy Jordan, um, Corbin Blue, um, and now, you know, Darren Chris. Like, these are, like, not only extraordinarily talented guys, but so nice and so easygoing, especially in this very small room. <laughs> <laughs> yes absolutely yeah. so yeah. so as we're about to wrap up here the last question that matt here is going to ask is the question we ask all of our guests at the end go ahead matt thank you very much chris this podcast is called jake's happy nostalgia show when you think of nostalgia what do you think of or in your own words how do you define the word nostalgia oh you're asking me oh mm -hmm. okay i thought I thought it was a disclaimer. Uh, no. <laughs> telling everybody he's like, <laughs> like hey, just in case you show. missed it at the beginning of the show. <laughs> it's called a nostalgia show. Yeah. What do you think of it? You think of a nostalgia. It's like beer. Let, what do you let think? us know in the comments? Uh, <laughs> subscribe and like and let us know in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, I was like, um, nostalgia. I mean, nostalgia always for me anyway, always makes me uh, think of something um, uh, warm and pleasant uh, nostalgia, like like a, a bygone time that isn't like, you know, here uh, anymore. But that's sort of like, that's sort of like the, the, the weird thing about nostalgia is like, you know, what we're having right now is going to be nostalgia at some point. So nostalgia really isn't something in the past. It's something that's always happening. And so you get to contribute to 
your own nostalgia. It changes what you get nostalgic for. Like it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, yeah, I was like, it's kind of like when my son was really little, I was walking him to school one time, and uh, he, he he said like, "What's time?" And I said, "Oh, it's you know, it's eight fifteen, so we won't be late." He's like, "No, no, no. What is time?" <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, well." Time is three parts. There's the past, the present, and the future. For example, when you just asked me, what is time? That happened in the past. And me telling you right now what is time, that's happening in the present. And us just about to be late for school, that's going to happen in the future. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, man. Yes. Great word send on. Well, Noel, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. This was a blast. Thank you guys. It was great. Yeah, so it was great. Yeah, it was great, great, to, great to see you again. I know it's we always, always, it's always great. It's talked great, it's great. a couple times on Bob's show. Yeah, it's great meeting yes. you. No, know, no, thank right. you so much. And special guest done. Bob. DJ yes. Bob coming oh, on. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much again for, uh, for what you've yeah. done over the years to be a part of our lives. And I keep up with good work of what you're doing now. And I cannot wait, cannot wait what, what sticks in store for you. Me too. <laughs> awesome. yes. keep, keep yourself with sesame right. especially yes keep in touch yeah. with us and yes else. absolutely we'll keep in touch and i'll let you know when this goes up great thanks so much guys yes. 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 Bye. And everybody Bye. out there thanks for listening yes absolutely yes. enjoy the yes. rest of your day noel cheers bye cheers. you too bye no take care bye it's goodbye from us as well. We absolutely enjoyed our time speaking with Noel McNeil. Um, links to his website and his social media will be in the description down below, as well as a link where you can purchase a copy of his memoir. Yes, and and he's also available on Cameo. So you yes, can, he's yes. on Cameo as well. Yes, yes, yes. You, you can get a request if you if any of you, any of you or, you know your uh, your loved ones are personalized from Bear, from Bear or for not a birthday. paid advertisement. Yes, <laughs> for a birthday anniversary, whatever. <laughs> yes, but uh, keep on the lookout for more wonderful interviews coming your way. Thanks again, Bob, for uh, yes. joining us. Yes, as always. thank you, Bob. Yes, you. it's always great. <laughs> yes, on again for this special now. one. Yes, and as always, what do we say, Jake? Keep nostalgia alive. Take care, everyone. See you next time. See ya. Bye. 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 Thank you for tuning in to another wonderful Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show interview. Be sure to follow Jake and the crew on social media and stream the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye-bye.